welcome. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Thank you all for coming out tonight on this rainy evening. Um, my name is Pat Walters. I'm the senior editor at Radio Lab. Uh, we have a really exciting and kind of weird show planned for you tonight. I think you're really going to like it. Um, I'm just going to set things up really quickly, introduce our contestants and our judges, and then mostly get out of the way. Um, so for the past several months, I've been working on a series of episodes for Radiolab about the concept of intelligence. And the series is going to start next week. We're very excited. We've been working on it for a long time. We're going to get into all kinds of fascinating and, uh, and at times controversial stories about IQ tests and race and genetics. Uh, we're going to go into the dark history of eugenics. Uh, and we're going to talk about some cutting-edge genetic science. We're going to have a little bit of Einstein in the middle. So it's, it's going to cover a lot of different stuff, all about human intelligence. Um, but tonight is just about the intelligence of non-human animals. That's why you're here. Oh, <laughs> like, who's so excited? And this is, she's in the show. <laughs> um, so, and the reason that we're doing this is because a couple of months ago, I ended up on the phone with a science writer I really love named Dan Engber. Uh, I was telling him about this series we were working on, and, uh, and he said, what are you doing on animal intelligence? And I said, I don't know. What should we do on animal intelligence? And he said, I don't know either, but I'll tell you what you shouldn't do on animal intelligence, and that's anything that has to do with the octopus. <laughs> <clears throat> Because Dan, Dan had recently come out very publicly against octopus Whoa. intelligence. Um, it's a great article. Dan's take is basically that this uh, tentacled ball of slime is just a bunch of hype. Uh, that the studies on its cognition are flawed, and that people have just become obsessed with its ability to do tricks like escape from its tank and shoot ink across the room or crawl out of the inside of a closed jar uh, or even predict the outcome of World Cup matches, <laughs> allegedly. Um, sorry, I'm very forgetful, so I'm looking at my script from time to time. Um, and then Dan went on a rant that went beyond the octopus about how messed up it is that we only seem able to talk about animal intelligence in terms of our own intelligence. Uh, he said, so much of animal intelligence research uh, is built on making animals do stuff that we feel like humans would be good at doing, uh, instead of considering their intelligence on their own terms. An example of this that I learned just last weekend was that for a long time, people thought chimpanzees couldn't recognize faces. Uh, and then finally, someone realized that the scientists had only been showing the chimps human faces, <laughs> uh, which feels <laughs> like a pretty big oversight. Uh, and as soon as they started showing them chimp faces, the chimps performed just as well as us. Anyway, a few days after I talked to Dan, I, I ended up on the phone with another science writer friend of mine named Laura Breitman. And I told Laura, we're working on this intelligence thing. And she proceeded to go on exactly the same rant Dan had, like almost word for word. And so it felt like we were sort of on to something. And so tonight, uh, we decided we would do an episode about animal intelligence that shifts the focus from us to them, that considers their unique abilities uh, on their own terms, uh, and in doing so, uh, hopefully might help us redefine a little bit what we think about intelligence in general for all of us. And because we're humans and we like contests, we decided we'd make it a competition. <laughs> uh, so tonight, you will witness a parade of uh, stories about incredibly intelligent animals, some that you've heard of, some you probably haven't heard of. Uh, and with your help, in the end, we will choose a winner. We will choose the smartest animal in the world, <laughs> according to the hundred or so people in this room. <laughs> um, so here's how it'll work. We have four contestants who will engage in a series of head-to-head -head bouts in which each of them has just four minutes to convince a panel of judges that their animal is the smartest. Y'all ready to meet our contestants? Okay, good. Okay, so first up, 
the curmudgeon who got this all started, uh, is a writer for Slate and the New York Times Magazine. Uh, he actually really loves octopus, uh, but just for eating them. Uh, Dan Engber. Um, next up, also a writer, author of the best-selling book, Animal Madness, and a professor at Stanford University. Just flew out from California for this yesterday, Laurel Braitman. Okay. Um, next is uh, one of my all-time favorite people in podcasting. She's a former host of the, the hit show Another Round, and most recently host of the podcast Strong Black Legends, Tracy Clayton. And finally, he's a comedian, a writer for Comedy Central, and co-host of the live comedy and science show, Drunk Science, which happens at Littlefield in Brooklyn, Jordan Mendoza. <laughs> I'm very excited. They're all so smart and funny and interesting, and you're going to love them. So um, uh, I'm going to bring up our first pair of contestants in a moment, but uh, first, let's meet our judges. Uh, Oh, we got a little music. Nice. Okay. Uh, so first, please welcome. Uh, th these two guys have done hundreds of stories about all kinds of smart animals. Uh, please welcome the co-hosts of Radio Lab, Jad Abramrod and Robert Corwich. <laughs> hey, Jad, Jad, you go over there. Okay. Okay. Uh, and, and maybe the music down just a little bit for this one. The real star of our judging panel. From humble beginnings in a shelter in Oklahoma City, she's risen to the highest levels of success in show business in New York. Her television credits include High Maintenance and The Leftovers, and she has appeared in more productions of the Broadway play Annie in the role of Sandy than any other actor. Like any great star, she goes by only one name. Please welcome Macy. Okay, so for, for those of you, <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh laugh, laughter of joy, and, um, for, for those of you listening to this on the podcast two months from now, um, Macy is a dog. She's, uh, she's accompanied by her personal assistant, Bill, who you will, you will also see participating. Thank you. Um, Okay, so before we start, I'm going to go over here now. Um, uh, before we start, I just want to ask the judges here one question to kind of set the terms and make sure we all know what we're looking for. Uh, I want you guys to just define intelligence in you know, two or three sentences. Uh, how would you define what you're looking for in the contestants' uh, stories tonight? Robert, why don't you start? Animal intelligence. Animal intelligence. Animal intelligence. Well, I would say that a very smart animal should be asked, how well do you understand your world? Knowing that some are sniffers and some are tasters and some are good flyers and so on. But really, when you see a fox on a snowy day jump into a pound of snow and somehow land right on the little mouse that's two feet down... I think that's a smart, smart animal mm -hmm. because, although, not like don't you know, contradict yourself now. Well, <laughs> I was just thinking that yeah, like one, this is one idea. Oh, then that's it. Okay, <laughs> then that's it. <laughs> Understand very well what you're doing. Do it really, really well. Yes, that's as far as I guess I'm allowed to go. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Jan, uh, I would say I mean intelligence is such a squishy term, so I guess. I guess it would help that we define it so we know how to judge. Yes. Uh, I think what I'm going to pay attention to uh, are arguments on behalf of creatures where you see the creatures encounter some kind of obstacle and then problem solve their way around it. Mm -hmm. So creatures that are flexible, can adapt very quickly, yeah. and um, 
And I'm going to give a special nod, I think, to creatures that show collective intelligence or like moral intelligence, if mm -hmm. that's even a thing. Okay. So that's what I'm going to be paying attention to. Okay, good. Macy, uh, what do you think? How, how would you define intelligence, Macy? <laughs> I think that's, that's, that's good, I think. It's, that, it's just what she, it, oh, oh, she said. A lot to say. A lot to say. Okay. You have plenty of time. In, in, She's just she, repeating Jad, really. It's just, uh, that, <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, just to recap, the contestants are going to go head to head. At the end of each round, the judges, she's very distracted. I'm like really competing for a stage time with the dog. <laughs> um, at the end of each round, the judges, Jad, Robert, and Macy, will pick a finalist. We're going to have three rounds. And at the end of those rounds, uh, the audience, all of you, will vote on the grand champion. So pay attention, keep track of uh, who your favorite smart animals are, and, uh, and you'll get to weigh in at the end. So is everybody ready to get started? Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Okay, so first up, we have Tracy Clayton and Jordan Mendoza. <laughs> Sir. Uh, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, Tracy, what is your, uh, what animal did you bring for this first entry? Um, the smartest animal in the world, hands down, is the crow. Boo! <laughs> wow! Okay. Okay. okay, okay, so we have the crow. I was just kidding, I don't really, no. I, they're fine, yeah. <laughs> no, he meant that, this is war now. This is the fight, we're fighting, we're fighting. Uh, Jordan, what, what's your entry for this round? Uh, a s slime mold. Oh, what? A slime mold. Uh, that I, have some questions, I have some questions about that. Maybe we'll wait until <laughs> okay. it's your turn though. So we're gonna start with Tracy. Uh, let's put four minutes on the clock. Oh, look at that, there's your crow. Right. Oh. Aren't they beautiful and very oh. intelligent looking? Yes, <laughs> they are. Okay, okay. It's time to go. Do I go? Yeah, ready? Okay. Go. So, if you don't know how amazing crows are, it's not your fault. It's because the media is racist and they've told you how to feel about crows. For example, <laughs> the most famous crows in the world are these. Here you got the dumbs, <laughs> the dumbs, the crows from Dumbo. <laughs> They're dressed like street pimps. They're hanging out in the middle of the day, no jobs, shiftless, lazy, black, coincidence, I'm sure. And then here, uh, this, is a, uh, this is Jim Crow. If you don't know about Google, you gotta do a Google. Oh. We, don't, we, don't know, we don't have enough time. So, I forgive you for not knowing that crows are the smartest. It's not your fault. Uh, are, are these the ones that say, can I see an elephant fly? Is that the same crow? That was, that was yeah. them. I thought That's about it. singing it, but I was like, my ancestors <laughs> are not going <laughs> to. No. Um, here's why crows are the best and the smartest. Number one, they are extremely resourceful. Have you all heard of this dude named Aesop? He wrote some fables. <laughs> One of them was about a crow who had to get like a treat or something out of like a pitcher or something. And so what he did was he dropped stones into the pitcher so the water level would raise, got what he wanted. Guess what? Crows really do that for real in real life. There have been plenty of tests done about crow and said, look, look. Aesop's like, yeah, I told y'all. I told y'all so. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, most of my exes cannot do this. <laughs> Crows can solve problems, puzzles, with as many as eight steps. Definitely none of my exes could do that. Point number dos. Um, Crows can be taught to talk. Right? The surprise gasps. To talk the what? To talk crow or to talk? To say human English words or human words, human languages. Um, crows are songbirds, y'all, so are ravens. But you don't know that because they're not parrots. They're not brightly colored. They're black, again, <laughs> racist. Just because they don't sing the same way the parrots do, you know, it's not, it's, it doesn't count. But their vocalization skills are really, really, really good. When you get a chance, Google Talking Crow, and you'll find some, some videos. I think we have one. Hello. Mm hmm Mm-hmm. Oh my God. <laughs> there it is. 
Yep. Yep. Exactly. That's exactly. a real crow video? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's an actual crow. Yeah. Crows can talk as can ravens. Corvids, as they are called. They're both songbirds. Point number three, B, C. Point number C. Crows have funerals, right? But they have funerals for good reasons. Not that humans don't have funerals for good reasons. But humans have funerals to make ourselves feel better. Like, oh my God, I miss Big Mama so much. I just need to see her one more time before she goes on to the whatever in the sky. Crows. Also, we still have wakes where we literally sit around and look at a dead body and wait for it to wake up even though we know it's not going to. <laughs> Evolve out of that, please. It's not, it's not time. Here's why crows have funerals, right? So Rashad dies. Bless Rashad. He's just plop. Rashad is the crow. <laughs> so the crows are like, oh, can I, what is, what is the cuss word thing? You can say whatever. Say it. Oh, yeah. shit, man, Rashad, what the fuck, bruh, what happened? <laughs> and so all the crows will like congregate around Rashad to see what killed him so they can be like, we need to stay away from whatever Rashad was doing because <laughs> look at Rashad now, you know? It's, and you need intelligence to stay alive. You know, the world's full of serial killers and sociopaths and this, that, and the third. Speaking of, point number, whatever number and letter we're on. Did I skip something? Probably. This bourbon is really good. <laughs> point number four. Pro oh, 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 out of time. Wait, wait. Let's, let's, let's give her, let's give her, let's let her. He's oh, no. Not, not partial to bourbon. Oh, no. oh, oh, I'm so sorry. Good. I'm so sorry. You have last, last point. Last okay, point. last point is that they can recognize faces for up to five years and they hold grudges. So if you walk past a group of crows, you're doing some shit, they just like, nah, don't fuck with this one over here. They tell all their friends, the next time you come around, the crows are gonna just, wah, 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 wah. just be, this motherfucker back. Don't trust him. It's amazing. So in conclusion, crows should not be called a murder. They should be called something smarter like a symposium of crows. <laughs> or... <laughs> Wait for it. A Clayton of crows. Yeah. Just throw it out there. All right. All right. The defense rack. Tracy Clayton with the crow. All right. All right. A really good job. That was great. That was great. Oh, what a supportive enemy. I hate good I'm going to look like an asshole. I think we're all winners here. Aww. Okay, slime mold. Now, is a slime yeah. mold an, an, is a slime mold an animal? No. Mm. Tracy says no. And you know, I, I fact I, I can't verify this at all. I am not qualified to be uh, on this stage. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, so you know, hey, we'll find out, right? We'll find out. We'll find <laughs> this out. This is exciting. Okay. It's uh, it's something. So okay, Jordan Mendoza with the slime mold. Four minutes. Yes. Take it away. Okay, you guys are probably wondering, uh, guys, what is a slime mold? Can we get to throw throw up a picture? No. Nope. The what? No. Nope, no. Nope. Previous. Oh. Previous. No, nope, I had a slide before that. Oh, okay. Uh, well, uh oh. Is that they're, they're climbing up that log. That looks like a slime mold, yeah. but I didn't make that slide. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, let's say I mean, that's a slide. I sent in some fire. slides, but guys, thanks for drawing them. That's really cool. <laughs> that's really cool of you. Okay, you're probably wondering what, <laughs> what is this? <laughs> Uh, but guys, don't worry, I freaking looked it up. I looked it up before this. A slime mold is a brainless, single-celled, pulsating wad of yellow goo. And no, I'm not talking about our president. Uh-oh. <laughs> Did things just get political? Uh, Trump's gonna feel that one, right? Uh, <laughs> can you imagine Trump listening to Radiolab? <laughs> Um, okay, what, okay, slime molds are actually incredibly smart. Uh, unlike Trump, I'm just, I, I, that's enough of that, okay. Um, which I didn't know until I read an article titled, uh, slide, uh, watch a brainless single-celled slime hunt for food. When I first read this headline, I thought, uh, okay, who is filming me order a Subway sandwich? Um, in this video though, I learned if you put a slide, yep. I learned if you put a slime mold in an environment where there is a complex decision to make, for instance, which direction to choose to find a good food source, this superorganism can solve that problem relatively easily by spreading its cytoplasm out, advancing and retreating in response to what, it's, what it finds. 
So this is a superorganism composed of thousands of nuclei, and they will collectively decide to make a decision for the group. Humans, on the other hand, are not at all good at collectively finding a good food source. <laughs> Have you ever tried to order Seamless with another person? <laughs> not easy. What are we gonna do? Pizza, Korean, Chinese, sushi. My roommate and I always end up choosing diarrhea. <laughs> There are three general types of slime mold. Uh, plasmodial slime molds, cellular slime molds, and Gary Busey. <laughs> For those who don't know, the joke here is that Gary Busey looks and is like a slime mold. Um, plasmodial slime molds are masses of thousands of nuclei that move around by spreading out in a fractal pattern learning the lay of the land, and even solving mazes and mapping networks with incredible efficiency. How efficient? It took human engineers years to map out a Tokyo rail system. It took a slime mold just hours. Uh, I read that in an article titled, Watch This Slime Mold Dunk on Japanese Engineers. <laughs> uh, I'm just kidding. I made that article title up. No one, no one wrote that. Um, Slime molds are so smart that a slime mold currently is on the faculty at Hampshire College. <laughs> this is a real thing. This is not a joke. This no. thing has an office. Can you imagine being a professor at Hampshire College? And then it's like, okay, yeah, this is cute, but I have been sharing an office for years. Um, the second type is a cellular slime mold, and this spends most of his life as a single free-willing amoeba, which sounds like a sitcom that just got greenlit on Fox. <laughs> This quirky, freewheeling amoeba just got the consulting job of her dreams. But can she balance love, work, and New York City? Check out all the single-celled ladies starring Zoe Deschanel as the slime mold. When, okay. when, one, when one amoeba runs out of food, something incredible happens. It starts emitting chemical pulsing. Uh, chemical pulses, assembling clusters of other amoeba into a larger superorganism. This is a process called chemotaxis, or if it's trying to save money, chemo uber pool. <laughs> um, this superorganism then releases spores to find more food and then dies. Chemotaxis shows that slime molds are altruistic beings. They'll sacrifice themselves for the benefit of the species. I, on the other hand, will never die for the benefit of others. I won't even give my subway seat up to an elderly pregnant woman who's carrying a piece of furniture. <laughs> Finally, the last category of slime mold is Gary Busey, an Oscar-nominated American actor who has appeared in over 150 films, including Lethal Weapon, The Firm, and Piranha 3DD. In conclusion, slime molds are very smart. Please vote for me because I'm Asian, and if you don't vote for me, that's racist. I did not know we could do that for the record. I had no idea. Wow. Give it up for Jordan Mendoza and the slime mold. Thank you. Okay. Uh, judges, do, we'll do a couple minutes here. What, what, deliberating, asking questions. What, what, what are your reactions to these two? Wow. Well, versus like slime mold. Scale, like that a something so small multiplied so many times could come to complicated and sophisticated conclusions is a pretty impressive accomplishment. Mm -hmm. Each it? individual... <laughs> No. I don't know. Yeah, it's I don't know. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I don't know. Pretty cool. <laughs> but but also I I was leaning in that direction. But just to sort of give uh, the crow a fair shake, uh. if a crow can see a, th a person and then remember it and disseminate the for reputation five years, five for years. five years mm -hmm. amongst the other crows, well that that's some kind of crow language or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, mm -hmm. well, very um, impressive. Macy, I, you have a crow <laughs> feeling one way or the other. She does. Crow? That's, that's yeah. What's she well, saying? Well, she's saying that she's not sure that she knows that many um, molds. Okay. Um, Oklahoma City is a sort of dry town, and they don't have a forest there. So she feels a little bit um, unequal to the challenge here. What with the unfamiliar... Oh, well, she did study them once. Do you speak dog, Robert? I, I, I understand that I can't speak it. I see. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, but well, she, is, she is partial to Gary Busey, which uh, okay. has, uh, 
has confused her. her vote. Well, let's 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 vote. Why don't we go down the line, Chad? Wh- wh- what do you choose? Gosh, I think just on. I think I'm gonna have to go with the the slime mold. Oh, wow. Ooh, wow! After wow. giving it up for crows. Okay, wow. so Chad slime mold, Robert. I, I'm going I, you know, with great respect for crows that hate well, I, I agree. Uh, they, they can, but I'm, I'm going to go with the slime mold as well. Okay. And Macy. All right. All right. Macy. Sound like crow. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> what do we, what do we have for Macy? Crow. Crow. So crow. surprising. Okay. All right. All so right. So surprising for an Despite animal. Despite her love yeah. of Gary Busey, yeah. she voted for crow. <laughs> okay. Okay. So the winner of the first round is. The slime mold. Wow. Mm-hmm. Great work. So your race is same sex. Great, great. Okay, okay. Okay. Round one is over. Next round, let's get our next contestants up here Laurel Breitman and Dan Engberg. Give it up, everybody. Thank you. Here. Oh, okay, Laurel. What uh, animal are you entering into the mix? Sperm whales. The sperm whale. Sperm okay. Whale. Okay. Good. And Dan, what will you be bringing to the table? The chicken. Uh. The chicken. Okay. <laughs> Zero. Oh, I'm so, 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 I am so interested in how this is going to play out. For this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll start with Laurel. We got four minutes on the clock. Ready? Take it away. <laughs> <laughs> I invited some friends. I don't. Is this on? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, great. Good. Sperm whales are huge, the biggest tooth whales, but in a lot of ways, uh, they're like us. They have big brains and really complex social lives, but unlike us, they live in a matriarchal culture. They probably even have stronger social and emotional bonds than we do. Young males go off on their own to find a new pod, and then everyone else stays together for the life. Sperm whales communicate a lot like us, too, physically and with language. But they also have a third way, and I think we should consider it like a sixth sense. Maybe you think about echolocation like boat sonar. Like a ping goes out and then it bounces, the sound bounces off a thing in their environment and then it comes back um, and giving, gives the boat like a grainy shape of whatever that object is. And dolphin and whale sonar does this too, and so do bats. But animal sonar also comes back as a physical feeling. In the case of sperm whales, it's really loud too. They make the loudest sounds of any animal on earth up to 230 decibels. Whoa. I know. It's actually, it's louder than standing next to a jet engine at takeoff. Our eardrums can rupture at 150 decibels, which is basically like a gun going off next to your head. Sperm whales make these click, creaking, and buzzing sounds in their nasal passages. And then they amplify and direct them with this big, fatty, waxy organ in their foreheads um, called the melon. And it's like, (laughs) I know, it's a terrible word. They probably have another word for it Um, (laughs) that's better. Uh, But it's like a huge built-in megaphone in their head. just like that, but way louder. Like crazy loud, so loud that it would hurt us to be listening to it. And this echolocation is so powerful that they can track a squid up to a mile away. And their social messages (laughs) probably travel just as far. So knowing what we know of their really complex social lives, their sixth sense likely comes with its own emotional experiences too. But we can't name those because we don't know what those feelings are like. So. I want you to try to imagine it, though. What would it be like to be like reading a book while suddenly finding out, just by feeling it, that your ex-girlfriend is coming around the corner of an underwater shelf a half a mile away? (laughs) Now, she broke up with you, (laughs) matriarchal culture, 
<laughs> You've been so lonely, but now you know the signal is meant for you just because of how it feels when you pick it up. And not only that, but you have an immediate, accurate picture of exactly what she looks like. Not just the shape of her, but the perfect curve of her jaw, her sexy 12-inch layer of blubber. <laughs> that you've missed so much. But also, you can also immediately tell how much she cares about you too, and that's why she's coming back. Also, you've been hunting a giant squid this whole time. <laughs> so, sperm whales might have a particular emotion that goes along with experiences like these, and they maybe even have a different sense of self. In the mid-1980s, a neuropsychologist named Harry Jarrison proposed that echolocated communications that are emotional in nature, so like grief or joy, might be experienced by whales and dolphins as more than shared information. They actually might come in as shared feelings, shared emotional experiences. So let's say a nearby sperm whale echolocates a message. Uh-oh. Oh, oh, oh. oh, shoot. Okay. No, it's not real. Bring it's it home. Real. Bring it home. <laughs> Let's say that a sperm whale nearby to you sends out a message about like grief or joy. Like let's say a friend of theirs was just hit by a ship. You're not going to pick that up like we would, like a human reading an email or a text message. What if you actually feel it? And instead of thinking about it as a thought, you just feel the experience of grief or joy. Jarrison thought that this might give rise to something called the communal self, meaning that whales and dolphins might not say, I, they might always be a we. We are sad, we are sick. And there's some evidence for this. So like in whale strandings, for example, when a bunch of whales will come up to the shore and strand themselves and die. But when we actually do studies on the whales, we find out that maybe only one or two in 100 was actually sick. Something is going on here, and I think it may be we sick. Um, wow. So I don't want to end on that super sad note, guys. Uh, it also might be why I'm whales sad. and... <laughs> no, I know. I'm going to lose just because it's sad. <laughs> okay, I'm going to tell you one really nice thing and then we're going to turn it over to the mystery, mystery animal over here. Uh, it also might be why dolphins and whales, there's so many reports of them coming to the aid of swimmers who are struggling <laughs> or fending off sharks from somebody who really needs protection or help or even doing things like this, which I love. This is a case of sperm whales who adopted a deformed dolphin. So a dolphin with a spinal abnormality who they welcomed into their pod. So sperm whales, man. Uh, what looks like extreme empathy to us might just them be being themselves, or maybe it's a new kind of intelligence, one that requires a kind of communal feeling as opposed to thoughts about other people's feelings. So, thank you. Well, right then, sperm whale. Well done. Okay. Well done. Very good. All right, oh. next up. Dan Engber. Chickens. With the chickens. Before I, I, as I talk, I want you to keep in mind what I think was the key point of Laurel's presentation, which is that sperm whales are very loud. It's what the <laughs> loudest animal. Okay, chickens. <laughs> They're very loud. That was, what. Well, anyway. Let me start with this. A chicken can beat a human in tic-tac-toe. A chicken almost always beats a human in tic-tac-toe. I learned this fact in high school when my friend Rob got obsessed with one particular tic-tac-toe playing chicken named Willie, who lived at the video arcade at Mott Street. And Willie beat Rob over and over and over again at tic-tac-toe. Willie wasn't unique. Birds like him were once a pretty common carnival attraction. Their popularity peaked in the early 80s when trained chickens were shipped around the country, rented out for $200 a day, or sold for several thousand dollars each. And these chickens were so good at tic-tac-toe that humans were getting demoralized. <laughs> at least one distributor started having the birds lose on purpose every fifth game to make it seem more fair. Now it turned out this whole thing had started years earlier in the South at a place called the IQ Zoo in Hot Springs, Arkansas. There, a pair of scientists, Marion and Keller Breland, had built a business out of training up strange animal behaviors. Their zoo was like a product showroom, a place to demo the ducks they'd taught to play piano, or rabbits that drove around in little fire trucks, or hamsters on trapeze. <laughs> but the Breelands... 
<laughs> you don't have to be that smart to go on trapeze. The Breland's most popular and enduring act was the bird brain, a chicken in a box which disappeared behind a screen to peck O's onto a game board. Chinatown Willie was one of those, or maybe someone else's knockoff. In any case, I watched that chicken play a lot of tic-tac-toe. Peering over Rob's shoulder, I tried to figure out the chicken's secret strategy. But then, last week, really last week, I discovered that all those observations were for naught. As I got ready for tonight's talk, I stumbled across a copy of an old instruction manual, which the Breelands would send out with their bird brain units. And according to that manual, the chicken in the box wasn't really playing tic-tac-toe at all. In fact, behind the screen, there was nothing but a single light bulb and a switch. When the light went on, the chicken pecked, and an O appeared somewhere on the board in the spot chosen by computer. I found this kind of devastating. <laughs> Partly because I'd promised Pat a talk on the intelligence of chickens. <laughs> but here's the reality. Chickens are kind of dumb. <laughs> As we've seen, they're even dumb compared to other birds. They don't have funerals, you know, they're not, uh, or make tools like crows. Uh, they don't learn to speak like parrots. In fact, if a chicken has any special talent at all, it's that when you chop off its head, it can go on acting like a chicken <laughs> for days or weeks or even months. <laughs> But still, I think there's something amazing about Willy and the other bird brains. It's not that these chickens were smart enough to beat us at tic-tac-toe, because they weren't. It's that we humans were dumb enough to lose. <laughs> I mean, tic-tac-toe is not a complicated game, actually. If you can think ahead just a bit, you ought to be able to play any round of tic-tac-toe to a draw, even against a computer. And yet, it seems we humans can't or won't succeed even at this very modest test of our intelligence. And I think that's useful to remember, especially tonight, because this whole project to rank species according to their smarts takes it as a given that a gulf exists between the very dumbest and the very smartest animals, that the chicken and the chimpanzee or the sperm whale or the crow live on separate continents of cognition. But I call that vanity. That's what Willie taught us, that there we were standing in the same arcade, befuddled by the same computer, each unable to succeed at the same simple game. We were joined together across several hundred million years of evolution by what we couldn't do. Judges, a vote for chicken is a vote for finding that common ground. <laughs> it's a vote for unity and kinship. A vote for chickens is a vote for all of us. Thank you. Dan Engmer with the chicken. <laughs> okay. Wow. This is so. Yeah. I, this is where do you go together, with that? Dumb together or heartfelt together? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Continuum. Wow. Why? What? I, what? I. I don't even know. What do? You, what are you? Which way are you leaning? Well, I, I did not know that stuff about the sperm whales no. at all. I. I should. Rec I actually played on Mott Street with the Chinatown Chicken in the 1980s, so I probably should not, and lost. But, of course. <laughs> so, you know, I don't know whether the other judge is awake, but... <laughs> uh, my own sense is I, I was so flabbergasted by the whale... So let me just understand what you're... You're saying that an animal at a distance will not only say, I see you, but will say, I feel you. Yeah, but they probably have their own word for it, right? Yeah. So like w the closest that I could think of in the, like, a mental exercise so that we could imagine being sperm whales is thinking about feeling it. But it would be some emotion that comes in as a physical feeling like through your jaws, into your forehead, deep into your freeway into your limbic system. Emotional experience that comes in wow. by feel. Hmm. Whereas the chicken's just going <laughs> But I isn't can't that... believe we're both standing up here together. <laughs> I, I <guess. laughs> no offense, Dan. No offense. <laughs> can I can I ask a fussy question about the about sperm whale? Is uh, 
isn't all emotion somehow it, it's it's a physical. physical physical right? Yeah, we have a limbic so, system too. So is it a question of degrees that, that somehow they are experiencing that in much, or is it an entirely different kind of intelligence? Would you think? I think that they have another way of accessing their emotional life than we do. So they have everything we have, right? Like their friend can go up and clap them on the back or give them a sperm whale hug or whatever, right? Like they still have that. And they also have language, but then they have this other thing, which I, to me, just because I avoid my inbox and whatever, it feels like some form of email, right? Mm -hmm. Like you send it at a great distance, but it's emotional and you pick it up with your face. <laughs> I, you know what? Wow. I, I, I think I got it. My heart goes sperm whale. I, as a political platform, I vote chicken. Yeah. But as my heart says, uh, I, I got to go for political. the sperm whale. <laughs> I, uh, this is like the Meryl Streepification. I mean, if we were better humans, we would have the kind of antenna and radar that a great actress would have, where you can just somehow project and return... You go to a movie like with her, and you go, you know, every move she makes like t touches you. Oh, I can't, I can't. <laughs> I am enthralled by this. What's what she saying? Doesn't like Streep. <laughs> oh, because because he's she's a Broadway star uh, herself. Oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> what, what about? She's feeling Streep right now. <laughs> <laughs> A little, <laughs> just a little. Scared. Well, let's. let's so, so you vote. I go sperm. sperm yeah. I go sperm. Sperm will too. <laughs> sperm too. That's three. A sweet. Yeah. Wow. Okay. All right. Tough break, Dan. All right. A dog voting against chicken. <laughs> okay. So first two rounds. First round went to the slime mold. Second round went to the sperm whale. Uh, for the third round, we're going to ramp things up a little bit and, and create sort of a new challenge for our competitors. Uh, the first challenge is that they are now going to have to compete with their nemesis from the first round. I'm feeling more tension than I expected to between them. I feel like those the losses were, were hard and deeply felt. Um, <clears throat> and so, so we're going to team them up and we're going to have a round, a two-on-two -two round. And the other challenge we gave them is uh, we noticed that we weren't really paying that much attention to the furry mammals. I think a lot of us imagine that we may be among the smartest animals in, in, the, in the animal kingdom. Uh, some of us won't, yeah. And so, but we decided let's do some furry mammals, but, uh, but the challenge was not to do any of the usual suspects. So no humans, of course, no chimpanzees, no elephants, uh, no dogs. Sorry, Macy. Um, Come up with an unexpectedly smart furry mammal uh, with your with your new uh, former enemy teammate. So, uh, Dan and Laurel, what did you uh, what did you come up with, and, and was it uh, what was the was the process uh, amicable? It was obviously the raccoon. Maybe you should come. Yeah, maybe we should. Maybe we should have a. Why don't, why don't you guys? Uh, maybe I wish we had a mic for you. Maybe we'll. Maybe we'll, I'll just go over here. So. So, so uh, it was obviously a raccoon. Why? Uh, OG of the animal kingdom, been showing us how to live in cities for a really long time. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> just I, there was no other choice. I don't even. Why are we talking about this? It's a no, it's a no-brainer. Um, what about Tracy and Jordan? Do you? Uh, what? How, how's it gone for you, for you with the teaming up? Okay, so it's not that I took my loss personally. I just don't understand how I lost, and I'm very competitive. <laughs> so uh, it's not going great. We're I'm still working on being able to communicate. So it's with not you. clear what you're what. Nah. We we have yet to choose an animal pet. Yeah, we don't. We haven't chosen anything yet. Okay, well let's. It's not my fault. It's, it's not my fault. I just want everybody to know. It's his fault for beating you the first. Is that what we're saying? Yeah. <laughs> okay. 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 So you, you two take a few minutes, maybe sit next to each other. That might be a start towards collaborating. Uh, and we'll start with the raccoon. So give it up again for Dan Engber and Laurel Breitman. Okay, so we're, gonna, we're not going to use the timer this, this go around. Um, and so I think, I think this is sort of a, a relay race type of collaboration, it's starting, uh, starting with Dan, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Take it away. 
In the fall of 1906... <laughs> We're trying to win, Dan. I know. In the fall of 1906, this headline, Smart Raccoons, was picked up by several major newspapers. The column underneath described a Mr. and Mrs. Golopard, who'd been traveling from town to town in a double-decker covered wagon beneath a family of trained raccoons that worked for them as chimney sweeps. It was not the only story of its kind. In those years, raccoons were often touted by reporters for their high intelligence, or their sagacity, or their skill at making mischief. Their most famous talent was for slipping out of things, or also into them. And not just chimneys. At a time when Harry Houdini was getting famous as the handcuff king, raccoons were known for something similar, the ways in which they could outwit their human captors, their genius for escape. This is the odd and tragic story of how we came to understand briefly, a century ago, that raccoons were among the very shrewdest animals of all, and then we forgot. <laughs> the link between an animal's slipperiness and its smarts was once well established among scientists. At Columbia University, Edward Thorndike had been testing the intelligence of cats and dogs by locking them in boxes. He'd seal the box with latches, bolts, or string pulleys and leave a snack outside as motivation. This was Houdini in the lab, an escape room, but for animals. Then in 1907, a psychologist in Oklahoma named Lawrence Worcester Cole thought to put raccoons through those same puzzle boxes to learn, as he put it, their proper place in the scale of mammalian intelligence. And he found some amazing things. His raccoons, Tom, Jim, Jack, and Dolly, would at times break free of the puzzle box and then ignore the food reward. It was as if they'd gone through the exercise, not in service of their hunger, as other animals might do, but to satisfy an inner curiosity. <laughs> or perhaps, said Cole, to alleviate their loneliness. Aww. Cole also found that his raccoons, unlike cats, could learn to escape a given box just by watching humans do it. Another experiment convinced him that raccoons possess a visual imagination, that they can hold a color in their minds. And based on this and other work, a soft consensus came together in psychology that raccoons were in fact quite high on the scale of mammalian intelligence, much higher than a cat or a dog at any rate, and maybe even on a par with primates. But alas, this whole idea was soon to be challenged and erased. In the same year Cole published his research, the president, Teddy Roosevelt, lashed out against the tendency of nature writers to ascribe human-like abilities to raccoons and other animals. The president, who is an avid outdoorsman, called this fake news. <laughs> Naturalists tried to fight back. Jack London, whose novel White Fang had been singled out for ridicule, called Roosevelt an amateur and a homocentric. But the damage had been done. Within a few years, some of Cole's most impressive findings with raccoons were challenged by his peers. That thing about their mental imagery? Rivals said it was a clever Hans effect. That Cole's raccoons were responding to a different cue than he'd intended. A certain lever that he'd used in the experiment. Even scientists who believed in Cole's research would find it hard to follow up. For one thing, the raccoons they meant to study kept escaping. <laughs> And a new paradigm was spreading through psychology, one that had little time for musings on a raccoon's imagination, or its curiosity, or its loneliness. In place of puzzle boxes, now there were mazes. In place of Tom and Jim and Jack and Dolly, there were rats. Nameless rats. <laughs> Lots of nameless rats. <laughs> so raccoons vanished from the lab, and then, as cities grew, they vanished from our lives. Out of sight, and for a while, out of mind. Dun, dun, dun. Van Enberg. <laughs> but, <laughs> turns out, as people moved out of the country and into the cities, the raccoons followed us. And our urban spaces aren't just the perfect place for raccoons to demonstrate their intelligence, but I argue that they are also making them even smarter. Raccoons move into our attics and our crawl spaces. They study us, and then they practice getting into our dog kibble, our trash, our compost bins, or they just make warm nests next to hot water pipes under our 
bathtubs. <laughs> Today, though, the people that know the most about urban raccoons are the people whose job it is to get them out of our urban spaces, like Mr. Raccoon, AKA, AKA Junio Costa, the number one no-kill humane raccoon trapper of the California Bay Area. <laughs> guy is amazing. Uh, Junior shows up to calls in his big truck with the raccoon license plates. Um, he told me that the animals are bold and curious and they eat pretty much everything. They use their tiny sensitive hands to manipulate locks and latches or pry out loose nails. They gnaw things open and then they take running leaps also to knock things over. If they find food somewhere once, they will keep going back there and they will never forget the spot. A raccoon will work on a problem like lifting up a garage door or prying open a window or prying a vent cover off of a basement for hours until they figure it out. Sometimes they'll come back like night after night to work on the problem until they solve it. And once they do, they keep coming back. Mr. Raccoon told me that once he got a call every night from the same neighborhood for like two weeks because one ambitious raccoon figured out it, they were all tract homes. And so what would work on getting into one? I've already won here. I don't know if you just want me to keep it talking. Like we, we've got this in the bag. Sorry, guys. Uh, what would work to get into one of these tract houses would work in the entire neighborhood. So she just went house to house to house to house. So... There may be no better example, though, of the problem-solving abilities and the persistence of urban raccoons than what I will call the Toronto trash can incident. <laughs> In 2016, Toronto had a really bad raccoon problem. They were breaking into trash and compost bins all over town, but they were also coming through people's drywall. They were showing up in schools, and very occasionally they were chasing someone down the street. <laughs> the more the raccoons ate, the bigger they got. <laughs> One male the city captured was 33 pounds, which is, I know, <laughs> the size of a coyote. People called them trash pandas, and uh, <laughs> the city tried to come up with a plan. The city ended up spending more than $20 million rolling out a, quote, raccoon-resistant green bin with a rotating handle, a double German locking mechanism that required the use of opposable thumbs to open. Susan McDonald, a comparative psychologist at York University in Toronto, helped test the bins. She's been studying raccoon behavior for years, and she thinks the urban environment selects for braver and more curious animals who don't give up right away. And she believes this is really making a whole new kind of raccoon. She even did a study that pitted urban raccoons against rural ones. She put trash cans with wet cat food in the bottom and bungee corded the lid shut. And she put them in both urban and rural areas, and then she filmed what happened. The country raccoons took a really long time to approach the new cans. And when they did, they just sniffed around the base of the bottom, like they could smell the cat food. But um, they gave up. They didn't do anything. The urban raccoons, however, went up to the new cans, even though they had never seen them before. They went right to the top and immediately started trying to pry the bungee cords off. Um, they also didn't even wait for her to leave. As soon as she turned her back, <laughs> they went for it. When the new raccoon bin, though, was unveiled, McDonald went on the record to say that it would be impossible for the raccoons to get into the new bins. She was wrong. Just a few months later, a female was filmed knocking the bin onto the ground and then using her tiny and apparently very strong hands to tug it open and then share the food with all of her kids. <laughs> the city said the lid must have been broken, but the owner of the bin, who was actually a reporter for the Toronto Star, swears that it wasn't. Since then, lots of other folks have reported that their trash cans have been breached. Raccoons are really the one of the only animal species to fare better um, as humans spread all over the planet. Not only that, but we are each problems for each other. They try to outsmart us, we try to outsmart them. It's unclear to me which of us is getting more intelligent faster. <laughs> all right, give it up for the raccoon team. <laughs> Okay. Um, any any quick reactions to the raccoons? I don't want to 
take up too much time before we hear the next Well, it's like it, it feels next. like a Hollywood premise. I mean, <laughs> soon they'll be in elevators, and then they'll become your servers at restaurants. <laughs> and then they will become, I don't know, clothes salesmen. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's a nightmare in the blue <laughs> It's so interesting that they learn us and then, uh, and then enter our world so, so the only thing that sort of saves it a little bit is so far it's just break and enter. Like it's yeah. not, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's not like, would you like some coffee, <laughs> or, or, you know, or something truly scary. Yeah. But uh, wow. Okay. Well, let's. Uh, so raccoon. So that's the raccoons. Um, how have you uh, team two? Have you? Let's the, maybe let's switch spots and come, come onto the stage and <laughs> bring back Tracy Clayton and Jordan Mendoza. Hey. <laughs> So, so here's, here's what thing. have we decided? We have not decided on a particular animal because it's just hard for me to. to I lost unfairly, so I see. Uh-huh. the I conversation see. didn't go a great. Too much. I believe her. Yeah, she. <laughs> <laughs> she was. Uh, she did a great presentation, and she was, she should have won. Yeah. <laughs> see now I look like an asshole. <laughs> no, no, no. We're all winners. We're all winners. Uh, We're not. We're not. Uh, we, I lost, and I don't like it. So here's the thing. Okay. So what? What did you? We've end up decided doing? on a type of mammal. A type of mammal. The marsupial. Okay. Yes. Oh, okay. We have the our own individual marsupials. And the marsupials are the the ones they have with the, the pouches. The they creepy got pouches. pouches. Yeah. yeah. Creepy pouches. I don't okay. enjoy. I don't like the pouches. Okay. So so it's a whole family of animals, or is it? Is it, is it two two animals or it's two animals. Two I, animals. I chose koala as okay. my animal, and, uh, and Tracy, you chose. I chose an animal named the quokka or quokka, depending. Wow. Okay. I hear it. Yay. J- judges, do we we allow this? I, I I'm open to it. Two animals. I, I we're here, man. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's do it. All right. Let's do it. Okay. So uh, it seems like you're gonna. Kick it yep. off, Tracy? I mean, I can. All I right. can, absolutely. Let's do it. The quokka. Um, uh, so I heard some woos for a quokka. How many people know what a quokka is? Woo. One, two, three, four, five. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> um, the quokka is the... I lost my place in my very scientific outline. Okay, so the... Nope, crows. So the quokka <laughs> is a marsupial, right? Um, native mostly to the island an island called Rottnest off of Australia, which is full of awful animals. Everything in Australia will kill you except maybe a quokka, I don't know. We'll talk through it. So, I still can't find where my shit starts. Uh, Okay, 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 here is why the quokka is also the smartest animal in the world. Number one, it is a PR genius, right? If anybody here works in media, you know how important public relations are. You know that there are very few people who are good at it. Quack is great at it. How do I know? I'm glad you asked. Here's how I know. I I did a search on Google Maps, right? Just typed in the word Quack. What what pops up? Um, Several businesses on the island, also in Perth, Australia, which I guess is also an island. I don't understand Australia. Um, But... There's so many businesses that incorporate the Quokka in this advertising. I found actual businesses named Quokka Cakes, which is a vegan bakery. They make amazing looking things. Quokka Press, Quokka Healthcare, Quokka Auto Parts. (laughs) And Quokka Garage Doors specifically. I guess they don't count as auto parts, I don't know. And I think the swankiest hotel there, which is now called Hotel Rottnest, beautiful, was once known as the Quokka Arms Hotel. Now, as a black woman in media, since I now know that we can do that, (laughs) I know how hard business negotiations are. You know, you have to ask for money. You got to make them think it's their idea. The Quokka clearly has it down, because what does the Quokka know about garage doors? Nothing, I'm assuming, but... They're on their logo, though. You see? It's not easy. Also, they are so good at PR that y'all probably don't know that they're considered pests on Rottenest Island. So the way that you feel about pigeons, which... Could you just say, what's the name of this island again? What? Rottenest? Rottenest. R-O-T-T-N-E-S-T. I do know a little bit about the history if you would like to hear. Oh, no, that's okay. Rottenest. (laughs) 
<laughs> okay, then never mind. <laughs> Honestly, it sounds awful, but the pictures are really, really pretty. Um, but um, but um, they're, they're pests, and they're pests because they're not afraid of humans. We'll get into that later. Um, uh, they're also really good at search engine optimization. <laughs> Again, media is the way I relate to the world. And when I say that, here's what I mean. Here is what you see when you search for an angry quokka. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God, he's so mad. <laughs> oh my gosh. Now this is the first picture that pops up, okay? This is a picture of a very, for the podcast, it was a picture of a very happy Happy, looking, he's smiling. Very friendly quokka. He wants a hug. He's just like, I'm so happy to see you, person I've never seen before. Tracy, could you, could, you, uh, could you describe it just for the people that are in the, yes, in the room? Yes, I would love to. So there is a quokka, which looks like a small, maybe wallaby-ish thing without the tail, and it's kind of like a mouse but not, and it just smiles all the time, and he's got his arms outstretched, and he just wants to hug you and love you. Hey, friend. Oh, my God. I, I know we haven't met, but I miss you. That's what his face <laughs> is saying for our listeners. <laughs> indeed, indeed. So this is the first picture that pops up when you search, image search for angry quokka. Here is the image when you Google ferocious quokka. <laughs> I know it's upsetting. I know. I know. Would you, would you describe this one, Tracy? So this one, oh, he's so cute. Or she. They are so cute. So this is, again, a quokka. And, and the backdrop is just like a sandy beach with a bike. Apparently quokkas ride bikes. That's cool. Um, and he's just like, you know, hey, guys, what's up? What's going on here? He's just kind of like looking and smiling. Hey. He's got his little hands together. Adorable. Adorable. Her lips Absolutely. are like pursed for a kiss. <laughs> you know, all they want to do is love you. That's it. That is it. And here's what happens when you Google quokka attack. You get zero stories of quokkas attacking people, but you get a terrible story of a man, obviously, who attacked a quokka. <laughs> like he kicked it into a wall. Right? How do you kick that into a wall? How? How do you do that? So, <laughs> the good news is that that guy was fined like $4,000, which should have been higher, honestly, because look at this, look at this face. Look at that punam. Look at it. So, I think it's impactful and it means something that when you Google a quokka, image search or otherwise, it's just cute, happy pictures. It's just the best image. Like, imagine if when somebody Googled your name, it was just like you donating all of your money to a village of, I don't know, burning orphans. <laughs> I hope that doesn't exist. Or something like but that. But the optics are good, right? <laughs> they know that. I don't think this is an accident. I really, really don't. I don't at all. So... Why don't you jump ahead to the, the last point? <laughs> to the, is, are we yeah, ready? I think we're ready. I think, Ooh, we're, I think okay. it's time. Literally, if, you're, if you have a hat, hold on to it. If you're sitting in a chair, hold on to the, hold on to your blitz. <laughs> Sam Jackson, I thought that the response would be, okay. So, <laughs> this, ladies and gentlemen, not to oversell it, is the most amazing animal fact you will ever hear in your life. Are you ready? Judges, are you ready? Macy, she's into it, okay. <laughs> Here's why the quokka is the smartest animal. When we, <laughs> serious business. When approached by the, pr by the predator, it looks so happy. <laughs> People love quokka selfies. From? You know, it's it's amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> oh man. We're gonna get through this as a family, I swear. Okay, when approached by a predator, uh, a parent quokka. I don't know if it's the dad, the mom, the, you know, pronouns. I don't know their lives. Uh, approached by a predator, if a parent is with their child, they will throw the child at the predator <laughs> to distract it while it runs away. So I need to describe this image for the people who cannot see it. Where did you get this? <laughs> Great question. I'm glad you asked. This image. 
<laughs> and you know she made it. It went in there. That's a bucket. <laughs> So this image is by an absurdist artist named, I'm going to mispronounce the name, Joan Corella, Corella with an accent over the last A. I don't know how to do that. Amazing. You should look them up. But for the people who can't see it at home, there is a woman who's very happy to be shooting her baby elsewhere uh, like, a, like a basketball, like she's at the free, she's at the free throw line. <laughs> That's what quackers do, you know? <laughs> and I think that this is really smart because you could make another one. You could make two or three. You know? If the both of y'all die because <laughs> cause you're that attached to your child, then what happens to your genetic line? It doesn't get passed on, right? This way, Quack was like, oh shit, I like Emily, but I can make another, I can make Emily the second. Emily said, Pyrm, Pyrm, and that's that. The quokka goes on to live another day. The quokka goes on to survive longer than anyone else will. Also, I feel like there's a joke in here somewhere about abortion and like late term abortions. Don't think this is the time for it. So, what I will say is that quokkas at the very least are pro choice. Yeah. And should every intelligent mammal not be cultured? Uh, all right, give it up. Tracy Clayton with the quokka, one half of the marsupial argument. <laughs> Thank you. It's your turn if you still want to go. <laughs> <laughs> it's very funny. I am scared. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I mean, I am. Yeah, I am. Um, so, uh, oh boy. So this is supposed to be a presentation about like what the smartest animal is. And a long time ago, I was like, yeah, koalas are very smart. So I, I was like, yeah, I'm going to do koalas. Um, but then I, I, I looked it up, and apparently koalas are famously stupid. Wow. Um, wow. Great okay, job so, for our team. Yeah. Uh, here's, how, <laughs> here's how dumb koalas are. Um, Koalas are so dumb. I feel like this is not the point. This guy beat you. This guy beat you before. You know? Can you believe that? Thanks for the reminder. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, again, I did make a mistake. Um, uh, koalas are so dumb, their brains only take 2% of their body mass, which is apparently one of the smallest brain-to-body mass ratios of any mammal. Koalas' brains are also super smooth, which is bad because the more folds your brain has, the smarter you are. The human brain is like Marie Kondo, lots of folding. <laughs> Shout out to my condo heads out there, sparking joy. Uh, you know who you are. <laughs> that guy. Honestly, that guy. I, I love her so much. Uh, uh, koalas are so dumb that if you put its favorite food, eucalyptus leaves, on a plate right in front of it, it won't eat it because it thinks that if leaves are not attached to a tree, it cannot possibly be food. Baby, uh, baby koalas How are does also. This help us. We're listen, just trying to win. I, we'll okay. see. We'll All see right. what happens. <laughs> uh, baby koalas are are also so dumb that they eat their own mother's feces, known as fecal pap, which is what I want my grandkids to call me when I start wearing a diaper. Um, <laughs> Finally, koalas are so dumb. Guys, koalas are so dumb, they even sound dumb. Listen to this. <laughs> so, so, perhaps, perhaps koalas aren't conventionally intelligent. Just like how choosing koalas for this presentation wasn't conventionally intelligent. It was not. It was not. But I propose that we rethink intelligence, partly because I'm stuck with this animal, but mostly because I believe that this animal is in many ways smarter than us. Perhaps koalas are like how my mom describes me, smart in their own special way. Um, let's compare koalas and humans to see who looks smart by comparison. This is a koala's daily schedule. Um, a koala sleeps 20 hours a day, while the remaining four hours they spend eating and mating. Incredible. Imagine only being awake for the amount of hours you need to eat and have sex. I mean, I'm not a huge fan of sex because I'm quote unquote awful at it, but boy, do I love eating. 
The human schedule, on the other hand, is horrendous. We sleep on average 6.8 hours a night. We wake from our nightmares, then spend 10 hours reading emails and worrying, five hours on a conference call, and two hours eating dinner out of a big bowl while watching Billions and hoping to God that Paul Giamatti's voice can lull us to sleep again. And as a side note, I am releasing an album of ambient Paul Giamatti noises called Sleep with Paul Giamatti. When it comes to anxiety, koalas, unlike humans, don't have to at all times be listening to a podcast because they need to drown out their own thoughts. <laughs> humans, on the other hand, are statistically all listening to a podcast. You are currently listening to a podcast because you, like me, cannot be alone with your own thoughts. For real, the moment I step off this stage, AirPods in, I'm listening to Radiolab. <laughs> Koala, when it comes to proving themselves to others, koalas have nothing to prove to anyone. But our most successful human has to own billions of dollars and date Grimes to feel seen. Uh, Elon, if you're listening, I actually really appreciate your work and I think you're doing a good job. Um, in conclusion, koalas have optimized themselves for life's greatest gifts. Eating, having sex for those who enjoy that kind of thing, and sleeping without the need to listen to Paul Giamatti's voice. And that's smart. Now who sounds stupid? Still koalas. <laughs> I, uh, I realize I clapped with everyone else. <laughs> but uh, you know what? I am proud of myself. <laughs> Do you think a koala would have done that? Clap with everybody else. Yeah, it's a real koala move. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wow, okay. So, we've heard from both the uh, pairs, raccoons and marsupials slash quokka and dumb slash smart koala. Yep. Could, uh, I, could I just add one other just for a s Wait, no, we're going to... Oh, Objection. Wait, uh, what Objection. oh, what is this? What's happening no, here? Laurel no, Braitman no. has walked a giant bone this across the stage the, and given it to rule. Macy, the dog judge. There's a law. This is this like is, witness uh, tampering or something. <laughs> what do you call it? It's Ma just bribe. Macy, don't you? Just Macy, bribe. Don't you do it? Um, does, I, she doesn't even like. She doesn't even like it, Laurel. See. <laughs> For those who are merely <laughs> listening, there was a large bone uh, placed on the stage next to the dog. So I'm that is for this. A so very large bone. Kind of yes. Almost as big as she is. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. But she's like, no, I have I think that you can see that she's indifferent it. to the bribe. It didn't work. As she, are we all. Yes. She, yeah, she so we, 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 we are not bribable. No. Right, Mace? You just, uh, you are uninterested in the bone, aren't you? Good girl. Good girl, Macy. Good girl. <laughs> uninterested in the bone, would you say? Well, she doesn't well, really have wow. a comment. Wow, well, yeah. Okay. She's okay, well, so let's let's, uh, let's proceed with you guys. What, okay. what yeah, well, that was I, a lot of that was a lot, a lot of stuff a lot to, to take, take in, in there. A lot yeah. of different arguments were put forward. Uh, I think I got to give this to the marsupial uh, du duet. Ooh. All right. All right. All right. Who said what? <laughs> See me after <laughs> the show. This was good. <laughs> <laughs> what cool. Row number two is having a lot of problems with our, <laughs> our judging. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I also just wanted to mention, just so that everybody knows that raccoon is the base of a really, really pejorative word for black people. Ooh, uh -oh. <laughs> just saying. Just saying. And you know what? As an Asian there. ally, I do not support that. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Good job. Good job. Okay, proceed with the judging, please. Mr. Krolwich. Oh boy. <laughs> well, I was I was I was uh, impressed by the boldness of the chicken of the. I don't. No, that chicken. The, 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 the raccoons. The raccoons. Yeah, raccoons. Uh, I was I was impressed. <coughs> I think this is one of those things where you learn something in the description, and I. It's nice that these animals are very pleasant. Yours, but it is just scary to me that these other animals are moving in. Moving in and getting closer and getting closer. So, in a sort of I selfish... I think the animals are smarter because we're stupid. Stop feeding raccoons, y'all. It's over. <laughs> no? Team Raccoon okay. is uh, unable to defend themselves right now, <laughs> sitting off stage. Crazy's in a position of power here. 
<laughs> so are you leaning? You're leaning raccoon. Is I'm what leaning I'm raccoon. Yeah. yeah. So we have a we have a tie. We have a tie here. That's good. Uh-uh. Okay. okay. Is Macy? No pressure, Macy. But. Well, I think Macy. I don't know well, what you, you made a I don't really. Know what you made there. a really big mistake. That's the case here. Oh wow! There is honesty and integrity in the judge community, and what we've seen here is a perfect example of that. Macy has decided that because of the shock and the and the behavior of one of the sides, she feels it only necessary to go all out with the, mar- the marsupial. Okay. <laughs> And she's thrown the bone down in a. In oh, a, oh, 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 she's <laughs> making her own. She's just it. leaving. She's, she's gone. She is. <laughs> she's she's quit. quit. Yeah. She's quit. <laughs> she will oh, have wow. nothing to do with this competition anymore. Okay. <laughs> Such honor. Such honor. All right. So, the, so those are our three rounds. Um, you guys can, can sit down. Let's give it up one more time for Marsupials. <laughs> Laurel, what so, what is that bone? <laughs> do we need to do we should I take it away? Oh, I, should we take I, it away? Can or? we ad- at least identify it? What kind of bone is that? Yeah, what is that bone? <laughs> piece of a steer. Piece of a a piece steer. Of steer bone. Wow, that's okay. the biggest bone I've ever seen. Yeah. Okay. Should okay, I, so, should I, should well, I? so 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 we've done our three rounds. We've we have our finalists, the slime mold, the the uh, sperm whale and the marsupials. And uh, the last, the, to pick the grand champion, we were going to go to the audience. Um, can, I, can I just interview just, just briefly? Brad, you, you want to? Uh, yes, there is just one animal I think we should just bring to everybody's attention. Okay. I know it's probably not right. You, as a judge, you're trying to wow. enter the competition? No, no, no. <laughs> wow. After, no, I'm just sort of... After, uh, after holding you, such, a, such yeah. a, f- a firm line of integrity and honesty. Yeah, you're... Too. Well, I just think you ought to know about it. I just, I won't vote for or against it. I just wanted you to know about it. It just seems to me that this particular animal is unique in, in this way. Okay. Brains, as we've been told, are expensive, unless you're a koala, you don't have, you know, barely have one. <laughs> uh, they use up tremendous amounts of energy. We have very, like a couple of pounds up here, and it's just absorbing maybe, I don't know, 20% of everything we eat or the, so on. So brains are costly organs. Um, I wanted to just mention the sea squirt. Because the sea squirt has, has figured this out and has sort of solved the costly brain problem. It is born in the sea. That is why it's the sea part. I, if you grab it off the gr- uh, out of the water, out of a, you know, a pond, and it, goes, it will squirt you in the eye sometimes. That's the squirt part. When it is born, it is kind of like a tadpole. It has wiggly tail. It has an eye. It has a baby primitive brain called a cerebral ganglion. And when it's born, it sort of looks around and says, okay, I gotta go someplace safe, someplace I call home. So it uses its eye and its brain and its tail to go here and there and here and there until it lands head first. That is like literally like... like (laughs) (laughs) Where it stays forever. And then it turns pretty much into a stomach. It, uh, It becomes just an eater and it absorbs its tail, it absorbs its eye, and it then absorbs its brain. So this is, you've heard of brain food, this is turning your brain into food for, for protein. So because it knows from now on it's gonna just sit on this rock and swallow for the rest of its life. Water will come in, <laughs> it will eat whatever's there. So it's like a living stomach, no brain necessary. So the lesson of the sea squirt, I just want to mention, because this is an intelligence sort of competition, is if you have a brain, of course you should use it. But if you've run out of any use for it, what you do is you eat it. (laughs) So you end up being stupid, but very well fed. And that, I think, is an extraordinary example of genius. (laughs) Okay, for the sea squirt. (laughs) About which I will say no more. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Okay, so we've got four finalists now, and uh, I, I'm going to just list them really quick, and then we'll walk through them, and we're going to vote by applause. Uh, so in reverse order, we have the sea squirt, 
We have the marsupials, which is uh, the quokka and the koala. Uh, we have the sperm whale, and we have the slime mold. So maybe get, let's get all four competitors back on the stage so they can absorb your praise uh, or or your <laughs> lack of praise. <laughs> oh, just praise, okay. please. I don't deal well with the other thing. Okay, so uh, just... Vote with your clapping and shouting and screaming for whichever one you feel most strongly is the smartest animal of the bunch here. Uh, we'll go backwards. So starting with uh, Robert's late game wild card entry, the sea squirt. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you know, you took a, you took no a swing. No, you know, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, next, the marsupials, Tracy Clayton and Jordan Mendoza. Pretty good, pretty good. Okay, and you guys are going to decide on the sort of the sort of who was clapping loudest. So, uh, next up, the sperm whale. Who voted yeah. the sperm whale? Whoa! Wow. Okay. Wow. Very good. Very good. Oh my god! I feel like that might be it. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. I would say C squared is in the lead. <laughs> Uh, and finally, uh, Jordan Mendoza's slime mold. Yes! Okay. Oh my God. Got some, got some people out there. I think it's. I think it's pretty, pretty clear. clear who yeah. the winner is, I right? Think so it's... I, I asked to cue up a drum roll, but I think yeah, we I... drum roll, please. Ah, we're gonna do it here. I think the winner of the contest, the smartest animal in the world, is. The sperm whale, the crown goes to Laura Braitman. So. Where are my uh, quokkas? We have a prize. We had a, we have a prize somewhere. I don't know who out here There's from our prize. team has it. There's a prize. Uh, we, had, we had planned to give a, uh, give a gold <gasps> fish what? to the winner. And instead we have a red fish. We have a... <laughs> A beta fish for, uh, for our winner, Laurel Braitman. One more time for Laurel Braitman winning our competition. She, she, she flew here from California with the, with the leg of an animal, and now she's flying back with a with So a do we not fish. care that she attempted to bribe the judge? We just, we just, don't, we just don't care about that, right? I, we're, I, guess, we're, I guess we're letting... I, I mean, they, they, the people have spoken. I don't know. The judge didn't yeah. want it, so yeah, it didn't no, work. But, okay. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> okay. That's, that's our show, everyone. Thank you. To, thank you to, to everyone. Please give it up. Uh, nice and thank yous. Thank you to our contributors. Dan Engber, Laurel Braitman, Tracy Clayton, and Jordan Mendoza. Take a bow. Uh, thanks to our judges, Jad Abumrad, Robert Frolich, Macy, and Bill Berloni, her assistant. Uh, thank you to the Radio Lab staff who put this night together, Rachel Cusick, Nora Keller, Susie Lechtenberg, and the whole team here at the Green Space. Uh, tonight's show and all our reporting on the Intelligence series that's starting to come out next Thursday has been supported by Science Sandbox, a Simons Foundation initiative dedicated to engaging everyone with the process of science. We're very grateful to Simons. And additional support for Radiolab is provided by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, enhancing public understanding of science and technology in the modern world. And most of all, thank you all for coming out. We can't do this without you. Uh, thank you for coming in the rain. Uh, and have a great night. <laughs>